There's another um, uh, book. It's called Monster, and he was a, a, a crip. He was so ruthless on the street, they called him Monster. Mm. And now he goes to prison and becomes Muslim. So, wow. And now I, when I went down to Southern California one time, I was trying to ask people, do you know what community this, this brother might be in now? And they're like, who are you talking about? Oh, you mean street sheikh. <laughs> so he went from being monster to street chain, wow. going that around, walking around in the hood, giving dawah. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the Mad Mum Loops. My name is Mahin, and along with me today are my co hosts. Sheikh Amr Saeed and Sim. Today we are honored to have a very esteemed guest, Sheikh Rami Ansour. Sheikh Rami is visiting us from the Bay Area where he be- began his Islamic studies at Zaytuna Institute, now Zaytuna College. He went on to study Islam in Mauritania with some of the world's most renowned scholars, including Sheikh Morabat al Hajj. Upon his return to the United States, he co founded the Taiba Foundation, which is currently the only organization offering a distance learning program in Islamic education. To incarcerated men and women. Sheikh Rami, Jazakallah Khair for being on the show today. Welcome to Chicago. We well, welcome. Thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. So, what brings you to Chicago on this, this time around? To the Windy City, which I'm looking out the window right now. It is pretty windy. <laughs> um, and I was thinking it was going to be a little bit hot and humid, but alhamdulillah, it's beautiful. I'm coming for the people, and the weather's what it is. Uh, but I'm coming uh, to a program uh, hosted by the Khalil Center on parenting. And I'm presenting my topic is uh, one is on fatherhood breakout session with the brothers about the Islamic view of fatherhood and how a father should really be. And so um, a general session for all attendees on the rights of parents versus children. And this has been something that I've done a lot of research and translation work on from the Islamic tradition. What are the rights of parents? What are the rights of children? There's a balance that many people like to ask, even in the circles of Tarbiya. When you're raising your children, are you supposed to treat them as friends? Are you supposed to treat them, are they considered your friends? Are they considered not your friends? You know, so as far as your tarbiyah and the way you teach, what do you tell parents? In general, I mean, this is, it's of a topic that we could have a whole conference on, you know, a whole weekend and still not even scrape the surface. Uh, But in general, what I would say is that there has to be a balance and the parent-child relationship role is, is uh, similar to the leader of a, of a nation and his people in that mm. there, has to be, there has to maintain some level of authority so that they realize that, that there, there is authority and that you respect authority. One of the things that we do in the prison program that we're, where we're doing distance education is uh, one of our main courses is the rights of parents. And for people who say, uh, well, my parents aren't even alive, we say, no, you're going to understand a lot of the Islamic concepts it, through that course, and one of them is respect of authority. So I believe that the whole uh, uh, teachings of Birul Walidain in the rights of parents in the Islamic tradition is setting that child up for properly understanding authority, whether it's in the employment, the workforce, whether it's in with the nation, um, with your leader and so forth, and respecting that authority, it happens beginning at the home. So the parent can't go totally friend you know, we're equal. They have to maintain some level of authority. At the same time, they can't go to an authoritarian level where there's no friendship, and they have to have some friendship. Uh, it's reported that Umar radiallahu anhu, they said, I mean, we all know who Umar is, and, you know, if you know if somebody got him mad, you know, Ya Rasulullah, you know, let me make my sword his necklace kind of a, 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 a person. <laughs> I never heard it like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um Mm-hmm. And uh, but at the same time, they said when he was with his children, he was like a child. Mm. And we know the Prophet ﷺ would let his grandchildren, Hassan and Hussein, ride on his back and ride on his shoulders. Yes. So you know that's not the, the the image that we get of a of a strict authoritarian par- parent. There's authority there, uh, but it's not too um, it's not too too controlling. So like in modern parenting terminology, they they say authoritarian, authoritative, or permissive. Yes, permissive would be. Like your f- friend that lets you do everything, authoritarians like the dictator, and authoritative is that person who's strong and firm, but they're like a friend at the same time. So in in this uh, seminar that you're uh, conducting uh, with the Khalil Center, a lot of it has to do with tarbiyah, right? Tarbiyah of parenting and tarbiyah of children. And the reason why I'm mentioning that is when I was in Egypt and I was married for about a year and we were planning on having children and I was just went off on this tangent for like a month of looking and seeking out books about how to raise your children. 
But at least five out of seven out of the books that I went through, all of the introductions had a disclaimer saying that before you try to do tarbiyah of your children, you have to tarbiyah of yourself, mm. right? So you have to know about yourself first because it's not going to be a very successful tarbiyah then. It's not going to, you're not going to embody that tarbiyah, right? So you have to tarbiyah of yourself first and it would refer to different books. And at the time, since I was in a hurry and I was kind of greedy, I was like, yeah, I know that, but, but, but then I couldn't go around it, right? So how would you say, even if it's one point, that a parent in order to tarbiyah of their children, what tarbiyah, even if it's one point, would they do of their self as a parent? Right. That's a very good point. And it's similar to when people come to me and they say, I'm about to get married. I want to study the fiqh of marriage. Hmm. You know, I want to study yes. the fiqh of marriage, thinking that the solutions of marriage are going to be in the books of fiqh. Well, the books of fiqh, what they discuss in the marriage is very simple in terms of, I mean, it's extensive. In Mauritania, when I studied, uh, studied there and while I was studying the Mukhtasar Khalil, the highest book studied in Maliki fiqh, the longest chapter is the book of marriage. We took a, took a, took you seven months where you're just doing full time study on one subject, one book, uh, and you're familiar with Shahamar with, with the Mauritanian yeah. method of study. So uh, seven months on marriage, but the majority of that is the the actual aqid, how to do a contract, what's what's a valid contract, what's an vi- invalid contract, the conditions, a large section on the dowry, sections on divorce and um, child custody, and a lot of it is really what it, what it boils down to is. What you do to start a marriage, the bare minimum to keep a marriage, grounds for divorce, and how to get a divorce, which is not really how to have a healthy marriage. It's the kind of things that when there's problems or when there's issues, whether in the contract or the divorce, the faqih can sit there and help you work it out. Say, how can I make this marriage right to begin with, fix it, and so forth. It's not how to have a have a right. healthy marriage. So what I tell people, I said, rather than study the fiqh of marriage, unless you're, you know, usually the sheikh is going to say, we're going to do the contract this way, and it's going to be valid. Don't worry. And don't ever utter the words of divorce. You mm-hmm. know, that's, right. that's a little bit more entailing than that. But, uh, but what I tell people, if you want to study something that's going to benefit your marriage, study the prohibitions of the tongue, study the purification of the heart, and study the book of the rights of parents. Because those are three topics, as you said, Sheikh Ahmed, that it's going to cause the person to have to do tarbiyah of themselves. And aside from the marriage contract, basic rights of uh, rights and responsibilities of the marriage and the divorce laws, those are rarely going to come up as issues in the marriage. What's mm. going to come up on a daily basis is how am I speaking with my spouse? Mashallah, how yes. am I, you know, what, what is, where is that coming from? Even though I might have a right in the sharia to, to do this or say this, is it, is it caused by a disease in my heart? And so in the same way, like that a person's doing that tarbiyah in the marriage uh, interaction, I would say the same thing has to happen with the children. Because right. if you go in there, just say, "Oh, Islam gives me the, the the upper hand in the in the in the relationship." Yes and no. You know, you have to balance that power out by right. having that tarbiyah to know that you might have the right to give an order to your child, and they have to listen. But where's that order coming from? Are you saying it in a proper fashion? Are you ridiculing them? Are you belittling them? Are you doing, you know, are you exposing, uh, coming out with your diseases of the heart in your projecting order, it on yeah, them? Projecting, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's something we don't think about a lot of times. I I only have one child. She's like almost three. So and at this age, it's just all fun and games for the most part. Um, but I, I don't see how, like, I guess it's, think about disciplining your child. Let's say you've got a 10-year-old, right? I can imagine a lot of folks would just they feel like, oh, I've got a 10-year-old here, you know, and how I treat them has no effect on how my wife thinks of the situation, right? You can almost compartmentalize that. You feel that's happening a lot in the community where people are kind of like disciplining their children, but then they're like oblivious to with their wife. There's no like correspondence with their wife on how what the breast approaches. He's like, okay, I'm I'm mad at my kid. He's getting a whooping or whatever. Or sorry, now no more corporal punishment these days. Yeah. But like, oh, you're gonna time out. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, on the on the books in the in the, in the U S. There are states that still actually allow. Uh, I think it's 17 of the of the states allow corporal punishment in the schools. It's yeah. just not. It's a it's a rule on the book. It's just not implemented. Oh, wow. You know, yeah. uh, it's kind of like people think that. Uh, uh, and we'll get to talking this maybe later in the show, but uh, they think that slavery is abolished in the U.S. Well, if you read the Constitution, the 13th Amendment, which quote-unquote abolishes slavery, says, except as a punishment for a crime. So still on the books, slavery is still allowed in the United States. Oh, wow. 
it's uh, still allowed uh, on in the Constitution. And up until recently, in the um, in the, some of the states actually considered prisoners to be slaves of the states. I think it was up until the sixties wow, or seventies. The that. last wow. state took it off their books. So there's things on the books there, and in the same way, there's um, there's things in the in the the corporal punishment with the children. It's on the books there. But in any case, we're not. I'm not advocating for corporal punishment, especially because the majority of people, when they you know when they reach out to that law in in Islam that says okay. You, the parent, have the right to discipline, whether it's verbally, because sometimes a harsh word can be worse than a, a whack to the kid. You know, mm-hmm. it could damage them for uh, extensively. So one thing that I mentioned to begin with is um, Sheikh Muhammad Mouloud, one of the Mauritanian scholars who has an extensive set of uh, curriculum from the rights of parents, prohibitions of the tongue, purification of the heart, edib of the student, edib of the teacher. Sorry, not edib of the student, uh, but edib of, yeah, the student-teacher interaction, edib of the masjid, edib of giving sadaqah, just ex- extensive curriculum of edib, of etiquette, of manners. And what he says in his book on or small treatise on disciplining children he says that the the parent or the teacher has to be very sure that they're doing this for the benefit of the child and not to vent their frustration because at that Mm -hmm. point it becomes haram Mm -hmm. so even though a parent might think oh i have the right i'm a parent i can discipline my child if the intention is to vent their frustration like they got yelled at by their office their 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 manager or their boss Right. right, and now, or and they got cut off on the freeway, and so now they're coming home with all this frustration. Are you really disciplining your child, or are you just using that that name of discipline of children to kind of code it, to sugarcoat it, sure. that you're actually venting your frustration, which is haram, which is prohibited. Mm. So that's one thing that they have to realize: what is my intention? And then the other thing is too, in terms of disciplining the children or or raising the children, we have to ask ourselves: Am I doing it because of my nefs, myself? Is that what's guiding me? Am I doing it because of my culture? Like, oh, that's the way I saw my parents raise me, so that's how I'm going to raise my children. And for the majority of people, it is that. It's the nefs, and it's the, sh- the culture, and it's the shaitan. Very few people actually st- uh, stop and, and say, okay, let me, let me think what is really the, the, the disciplining uh, that I should be doing. I'll give you a really uh, sto- uh, interesting story. I was sitting with uh, our sheikh. Uh, one of our shiuch, Murabat Had Amin, Muhammad Al Amin, which you had the honor, Sheikh Amr, to meet. And he was the beautiful thing about the Mahdara system in Mauritania is that the Sheikh is teaching all children. So this mm-hmm. child next to you might be studying Alif Bata, mm-hmm. and the student next to you is studying logic, grammar, and astronomy, all in the same halaqa. And so this student is getting his lessons, the Sheikh is going around. So I was sitting on the, the right side of my Sheikh, and he was, I was waiting for, oh, I was in the middle of a lesson of the Mukhtasar of Khalid, which is a high legal uh, dars of, of Maliki, uh, the code of law. And to, uh, to next to me was uh, a child learning the alphabet. Mm-hmm. And so he wasn't paying attention to his loh, to his wooden tal- tablet. So the Sheikh turned to him and he said, um, he, he reprimanded him. And he got, he got, his voice got loud, his face got, you know, angry. And I was, I was in the middle of my lesson. So literally in the middle of my lesson, the sheikh turns to the student, verbally reprimands him. And I'm thinking to myself, man, he's angry. Now he's going to turn back to me <laughs> and the lesson's going to continue with me. You know, if somebody's yelling and then you have to interact with them, you know, it's going to spill over to you. Sure. And subhanAllah, he turned his face to me with the biggest smile and no anger on his face. And he said, meshi. You know, continue. <laughs> and what that told me was that his use of of uh, of visible anger and a, and a raising of the voice to that child was not emotional at all. It was a tool that he used that chose to use at that to- moment, and he mm. turned it on and he turned it off. So if a person can do that when they're disciplining their child, then they know it's in line with the sunnah. But if their emotions have taken over and they can't turn it on, turn it off, then there's some problems there. Wow, that's deep. So Sheikh Rami. Um, after coming back from Muratan, you studied an organization called the Taiba Foundation. Uh, what's Taiba about and what's inspired the idea behind it? So uh, Taiba is an organization right now where we're focusing on distance education for uh, incarcerated and formerly incarcerated men and women in, in the U.S. The main focus of our education is Islamic, and I can talk about that a little bit. But we also offer other types of education, uh, whether it's uh, pursuing an AA in a paralegal uh, format or offering scholarships to help students once they graduate or while they're in prison to do an AA or a, bas- a, a master's or a bachelor's degree and so forth. So we were our focus is education, and the reason why we're now currently focused on education is that, according to the U.S. Department of Education and also other research, the number one thing that allows prisoners who have been released to 
not go back to prison, the number one factor is post-secondary education. Mm. So we offer Islamic education by distance, but in a post-secondary uh, education format. Uh, Can we rewind a little bit in, in the sense because uh, how did... How did it start? How did, how did you get into this? Because it seems something so different from what a lot of uh, people in the United States in terms of uh, scholars and the shayukh, they don't really uh, give any attention to the prisoners yeah. or the, that, that, that segment of Muslim population. Right. Well, in general, I mean, most of society uh, doesn't give into any attention to the prisoners. Yeah. They're kind of, they're one of the forgotten members of society, whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim. In general, just prisoners are forgotten. We're all familiar with the story of Surat Yusuf, um, or the Prophet Yusuf, Joseph, alayhi salam, peace be upon him, and how he got in the prison. And if you remember in the story, when he, after he interpreted the dream for, for, for two of the, his co-prisoners, and one was executed and one became the servant of the king, he said, he, just, he said, remind the king about me. But when that guy left, what happened? He forgot about He forgot. Him. You know, he forgot about Yusuf, alayhi salam, which is, I mean, if you could forget about Yusuf, who's a prophet of God, and here he is in the, there he is in the and prison. It's and beautiful, too. Beautiful, and he forgot about him, then yeah. what about everybody else in the society? Wow. So when I see the hadith about, uh, or first and foremost, of course, the, the ayah in the Quran, the verse in the Quran that says, uh, describing the believers, ala hubbihi, that they give out of the love of Allah, or another interpretation of the hadith, uh, the, the verse, out of the love of, for what they're giving, like they love this stuff, but they give it anyway to the poor. Uh, that we give it to the poor and to the orphan and to the prisoner. And this was talking about the prisoners at the time of Badr. So imagine the non-Muslims who were trying to kill the Muslims, who were trying to kill the Prophet Allah Muhammad Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and they were captured alive and they were taken as prisoners. Allah is saying, feed those people. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said he used to say, honor the prisoners. And so some of the Ansar and some of the Sahaba that were at the, the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at that, they said, we would feed those prisoners before we fed ourselves. And we would give them food that was better than what we were feeding our own family. So that's the Islamic tradition of you take care of the prisoner, even if they're a criminal. We're not justifying their crime. We're not trying to you know, uh, say that they're innocent. We're saying, no, we realize if, even if they're guilty, if they're proven guilty, that we still have a duty to, to take care of them. And it's a reminder to the humanity that they still hold. So how I got in, involved in, in, in this work is that um, about 14 years ago, uh, a brother who was recently released from prison came to the Zaytuna Institute. And he came there. He was living in the area. But, and he didn't know how close he was to the, to, to, to the Institute. But they had been... Uh, there was a group of prisoners inside some of the, the California state prisons. And they were, were searching for knowledge. They were whatever book they came across. If a person came and had some books or had some audios or videos, whatever little resources that they had, they were trying to seek knowledge. And they formed a group. They said, our main purpose is to, to, to seek knowledge. So when this brother got out, he said, we want you to go to Zaytuna Institute and ask us and ask some questions. So he came there. He actually turned out to, to live just down the street. He came there. I met him. And then he said, you know, I have some uh, questions from some people in the prison. Would you mind answering them? And I'm thinking to myself, okay, these are going to be simple questions. You know, like, what are the basics of prayer and purification? He started asking me questions about usul al-fiqh, mm-hmm. you know, the foundational methodology of how we de- derive uh, legal, prin- uh, legal rulings, you know, usul al-fiqh, legal principles, mm-hmm. uh, uh, a legal theory. Another translation might be uh, usul al-hadith, you know, hadith terminology, mustalah al-hadith. And so I was, I was looking at him as he was asking this question. I said, who are these Muslims in prison? So he started ask, uh, asking me these questions. I said, whoever's asking these questions, he needs a teacher. Like, he has some talent. So we started with some uh, p- collect phone calls. And there were about, uh, at that time, they were really gouging the prisoners and their families. It was $7.50 for a 15-minute phone call. That was the only way they could call out. And so we started that with some lessons. And then over a period of almost uh, nine years, we went through a lot of texts with that, w- w- with that student and with uh, myself. I went with that student and with some other students. And then um, I started it as a personal initiative. And then my parents, uh, may Allah bless them, uh, they started supporting it, just you know, paying for the phone calls. I was a student at the time, so $90 a month in collect phone calls was a lot of money for me at the time. So they helped out with that. 
and then Zaytuna Institute incorporated it in, as part of their, their prison da'wah to where my programs and my translations and my sending of material, uh, books and translations and CDs into the prison uh, was partially supported by them. And then in 2008, I founded it as an organization to a nonprofit to, to, to house the work that I was doing because it had grown from one student to 10 students to now 670 across the U.S. You know, uh, just on the way here, me and uh, Sayyid uh, were talking about Yusuf alayhi mm-hmm. salam. And that's why I was really happy that you mentioned that. Is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted his dua and he gave him protection by putting him in prison. This, was, this is yeah. how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala works in ways that we'll never understand. Which is why he never ceases to amaze us. Uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects him in prison and people realize what he actually is, right? And a lot of times, based on your uh, your documentary, and I suggest all of our listeners to watch the documentary, it's called The Forgotten Believers in Prisons or Who Are Incarcerated. It's available on United YouTube. States. Yes, it's on YouTube. You can watch it. It's about 20 minutes, and it's a, it's a really good uh, piece of information, inshallah. But one thing you realize is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he puts people in prison and they become Muslim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordained that for them and that was a type of protection for them because they had to get out of their situation to rectify themselves, to reform themselves to la ilaha illa Muhammad Rasulullah and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings them back into the, the, the our what we consider our free world, right? And then your job comes in. This is why I find your role very interesting is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took care of them and he ordained them the prison even though it's not a prison. It's a place of hidayah now, mm-hmm. Right? And they change in there, and then they're handed off to you. Based on that being obviously an awesome responsibility, but it's a big responsibility and it's an honor, right? And we know with every honor comes responsibility. How do you make that transition smooth? And how do you incorporate everything that you may have learned in classical texts in a contemporary format that from people that are incarcerated now, right? That's a, that's a, a number of good points you made there. And um, just to step back a little bit in the question um, is is the, the story of Surat Yusuf is, a, is definitely a guiding factor for anybody in prison, the prisoners themselves, anybody working in prisoners, whether they're chaplains, mm-hmm. staff, volunteers, whatever it might be, and then for the general society to understand, like, how does this fit in you know, to our Islamic worldview? Uh, one thing I will mention is that one main difference between Yusuf alayhi salam is that he went to prison, he was innocent. Yes. And we all know he was innocent. Yes. And he didn't even have a thought you know, towards the wife mm-hmm. of the Aziz. So... He uh, he went in as an innocent, and granted, there are some people that are in prison uh, that, that are innocent, and the Innocence Project is doing a lot of work in this field of getting the freedom for pe- men and women that have been wrongly convicted. Um, and recently, we had one Playba student who spent 28 years in prison, two, eight, 28 years in prison, and he was found um, um, innocent by through the Innocence Project. Wow. He walked so, out of the prison a free man. Him. And but when you see that person, you don't see, you don't see uh, regret. You don't see frustration. This man literally lost twenty eight years of his life. He's like he went into a time capsule, yeah. like Ashab al Kaf, the the companions yeah. of the cave, went in there, <laughs> right. came out twenty eight years later. And yet, when I speak with him, he's one of the the brightest smiles, the happiest people I have met in my life. Wallahi, by Allah. And yet you have people on the street say, oh, I can't find a job or I'm having trouble, you know, getting into the medical school of my choice or I'm having this or I'm having that or I'm having troubles. And you see more hem and more depression and more anxiety and more frustration on the face of these people oh. than you do with this person. Wow. Part of it happens because in that prison situ- the, the, that situation, and I've heard this from mu- multiple people, they were incubu- incubated from the ills of society. Specifically from the inner cities, from the the crime infested, drug infested um, areas that they were that were living in. I mean, seeing dead bodies as a young child. Imagine what that does to the development of a human being. If you're four or five or six years old and you see a dead body, what does that do to your uh, development? Mm-hmm. So these men and women, that's the situation they're coming from. They're put into prison, and I've heard another man who spent 28 years, also for a crime that he didn't commit. But in California, if you're in the in the same car. And another person commits a crime, whatever conviction that person gets, you get. So a a note to all the youth, beware of who you get into a car with. So this man that I know walked out of prison after 28 years, and another uh, brother spent 28 years in prison. He was in the car when a drug deal went bad and the person driving the car shot somebody. 
And he didn't. He he thought it was just going to be we were going to rob this person of his. So he went in the car with the intent to rob somebody, to make it look like a drug deal. But we're actually going to take your money and your and keep the drugs. But they ended up killing the person since the other person went in on a murder um, conviction because he was in the car. He also got the murder conviction as well. So be careful of who you get into a car with. And um, he spent he spent twenty eight years. But he told me he said he said two things. He said one. He said, even if I wasn't convicted for, for the, I didn't, I wasn't guilty of that crime, but I was convicted of it. He said, there were other things that I did, you know, and so that was a, the way he said, I saw Allah taking me out of those areas and giving me what I needed, the time that I needed. He said, the other thing is, is that I could have wound up dead on the streets of LA. He was a gang member, a crip at the time, very, a very active crip. I mean, he told me stories of him being on the roof of his house taking shots at police police officers with stolen with stolen hunting rifles. Oh. So, I mean, this is the type of gang member he was and so he says I most probably would have ended up dead dead on the streets of LA. But he gets into prison and now he's incubated from from a certain aspect of that. The jahiliyyah, the ignorance of the streets still goes into the prison, but he said I was protected and that's how I found Islam. And if that's the way Allah wanted me to become Muslim, alhamdulillah. And he says it with complete acceptance of the qadr of Allah. So it, is a, it's, it definitely has that. Now, going to your second part of the, the question of how do I, now I'm stepping into that arena. Exactly. They've gone through this process of, you know, he was neglected as a child, abused as a child, maybe a parent uh, uh, on drugs, gangs, whatever it was that caused this person to end up in prison. Now they become Muslim. Now I'm teaching them. The first thing that I remind myself, and this is what all teachers should remi- remind themselves, is that you're just one, you're one block in this person building up their house you know i'm not the sebab of their hidayah i'm not the reason for their guidance allah guided them allah chose them to guide i'm just interfacing with them at this point of their uh, of their life and i'm going to give them what they need i'm going to give them some provisions to as they continue on their journey they're not i'm not here to guide them to me as a teacher which a lot of and i will say there's a number of shiuch in our community they turn the guiding of the sheikh into guiding to the sheikh Hmm. The sheikh is supposed to guide to Allah hmm. as if to say, let me hold your hand. I'm going to point you in the direction that you're on your journey. You're on your journey. Continue, And once we're done, you continue on your journey. And every once in a while, you might turn around and wave to me and ask for advice. But I'm guiding you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'm not saying me, I. I'm saying this yeah, is the, the, the duty of the teacher. But not to guide to the teacher. That's not to turn point. the student into a servant of the teacher. Sure. Not to turn him into even a servant of the, of, of the, the mission of the teacher. Like, if you want to go off and be a butcher, a baker, a candlestick maker, whatever it is, I'm just going to give you the provisions that you need. So, when in the, going back to that ayah I mentioned earlier, <inaudible> We feed you, the poor, the orphan, and the prisoner, <inaudible> for the sake of Allah. <inaudible> we don't want any thanks or any um, um, reward for this teaching. So, that's a principle that all teachers should have. That when we interact with the student, we're feeding them for the sake of Allah, and we're not expecting anything in return. That is an amazing. Um, so that's my guess. interaction with them. Yeah, um, and we have to see it as um, the way we look at these individuals uh, that are incarcerated is Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is actually protecting them, and we don't know what type of hidayah they're going to get, right? And that's uh, a way that we sympathize with them. And yeah, inshallah. You mentioned a, a point about how sometimes the influence in prisons isn't always the best either. I was watching a movie once, and it was someone's like it was a biography, and so, someone who was a lifelong criminal. And he said when he went to prison, he went in with a bachelor's degree and came out with a PhD. So, in light of that, how is how are they still coming to Islam? Like, is it what's the perspective of these individuals? Because they're probably most people are still improving their intellect as far as crime goes and being better criminals, not really necessarily becoming reformed individuals, right? Or am I is that the proper? way of looking at it like yeah well in terms of like the crime in prison crime doesn't stop when they go to prison it's just it's a continuation and in fact some people will actually try to get into prison and there's a, a certain level of credibility that you get like what they call street cred by going to prison and there's certain um organizations gangs and so forth that will uh, 
operate and some of their main operators, their shot call, their shot callers, are in prison and they call the shots on the streets through the prisons. So it's um, somebody might actually go into prison to get closer to a shot caller or to rise up in the ranks or whatever it might be. There's also there's a drug trade in the prison. There's a cell phone trade in the prison. There's uh, prostitution in the prison, and some of it's uh, through visitors smuggling in things. Some of it's through volunteers or even staff smuggling and mm. contraband and so forth. Mm. So there's there's a lot of crime that happens in prison, and then there's even prisons for the prisoners. They call them shoes, special housing units in California. There's one in Pelican Bay, and it's kind of like the 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 prison for the the, the prisoners. If you do crime in the prison. You go there, so it's um, it's it's just an extension of the jahiliya that occurs in society. And then you have people that are running the prison. Some that are looking for the reform of those individuals, but some of them are just evil human beings. Mm-hmm. I'll say that they're just evil human beings. One person told me he said that he was. Look at this story. This person was a gang member. He was an active affiliated gang member. He becomes Muslim and he wants to drop out of the gang which the prison administration, they should encourage that. They should right. encourage person dropping out of an illegal organization, conducting illegal activities. Well, because he dropped out of the gang, now he was in, the, uh, he was in a, uh, a Mexican gang, the white supremacists, who now they, they, they issue an order, any and all gang drop, dropouts, regardless of the gang they dropped out, kill on, kill on sight. They issued a kill order. So he goes to, and this is happening now. This brother uh, contacted me from um, isolation, segregation, the, the, what they call the hole, and says, what should I do? You know, should I go to the special needs yard where it's a, it's a protected yard where they, they, they give more protection to the, the, the students and so forth? Um, and uh, so he, the, the, the kill order is out there, literally. And now, he became Muslim. That was the reason why he dropped out. He said, mm. I'm Muslim. My affiliation is, with, is, is, is to the deen of Allah, to the religion of Allah. But now I, I don't want to be associated with that, with that. But now we have this kill order from the white supremacists. So when he talked to one of the guards, he said, and he was explaining to his issue, he said, I don't give a F what happens to you. That's the attitude that some, mm. some people will take. I don't give an F what happens to you. This is a human being whose life is at stake. Right. And you're there as a public servant to protect this person. And you're saying, I don't give an F what happens to you. So that's the environment that's happening. Now, again, there are people there do, with really good intention. There's guards and so forth that are, that are there for, and they are helping these men and women reform their lives. So you go in that, in that, in that, in that scenario, and... Um, there's just it's just a continuation of the jahili of, of society. Um, I had a, something to mention also, uh, just a little bit about my personal experience is when I went came back from abroad and when uh, from studying, I realized that a majority of the people that were questioning or asking things, about ninety five percent of things were social issues. Very little had to do with fiqh. The only time I actually answer fiqh questions possibly is in Ramadan or the last 10 days, or, you know, during the second Eid. But other than that, it's not too much. A majority of people, and they actually expect you, if you go and study abroad, you probably face this too. Mm-hmm. Wait, you don't know about this? Wait, you, what, did you, what were you doing for 10 years or 7 years? I tell you, like, well, I'm, I'm not a psychiatrist, you know, I'm not a psychologist, right. but I, I'll see what I can do to help you, I can facilitate something, right? So the expectations are there also. So be it, alhamdulillah. So when, when, when I come back, now I have to kind of, up my game and study all these different things and cognitive behavior therapy and all these different types of uh, uh, studies in, in psychology. Now, for yourself, after being in Mauritania for uh, how many years approximately? Uh, about four and a half years there four and, and four and a half years, four and a half, uh, close to actually five years with a Mauritanian sheikh that was in Zaytuna Institute. Allahu Akbar, yeah. Allahu Akbar. So how w- were you able to take that same knowledge and use it in social work for the incarcerated, because it's classical text, mm-hmm. the Khalil, amazing book and fiqh, that's been written hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And the concepts you can apply, but it requires a certain type of knack and a certain type of depth. How do you how do you transfer that knowledge? Or did you just study completely separate social work type stuff and then you incorporated it? But, before you answer the question, I want to add a little quick point to what Sheikh Amr mentioned. Specifically, when you studied with Sheikh Murabat al-Hajj, yes. my understanding is he was like, in a, like wherever, wherever his village was, that redefines the sticks, yeah. right? <laughs> it's like 5,000, 500 miles from uh, the capital. So I can't imagine you, you got a lot of like, I don't know if you got a lot of murders hanging around there or whatnot. <laughs> no. You know, so like, it, but it's like a spiritual enclave. So with that context in mind too, you're learning spirituality from him, but... 
you know, I, I imagine a lot like the practical nature of that wouldn't like it's not like studying, for example, in the Bay Area. If you're in Berkeley studying for a Mauritanian Sheikh, just down a block, you've got a hood. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like you, you, you know what I'm saying? So on top of what Sheikh Amr mentioned, country, we're trying to get your insight with that as well, along with the actual studies and with the fic and whatnot, but also the practical experience of your environment there and translating that into now modern day yeah. America into prisons. Yeah. Because sometimes some people come back and they completely act like or they completely forget about where they came from. Mm-hmm. And it's very hard. Like, oh, these people are crazy. But obviously, that's not the situation with you. Yeah. Right. You uh, you accepted it. You embraced this challenge. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I I would have to say that one of the things that that I realized, like I went to Mauritania, I studied certain texts, and one on one of my trips back during my trips back to the to the U.S. to visit my family. Usually, I would come back in Ramadan, as you know, Sheikh Amr, The Mauritanian summer vacation is actually Ramadan. The, student, mm-hmm. right. the mahdaras clear out during Ramadan, so I'd come back from Ramadan. And one of the things that I noticed was that the same text that I was going through. In like what you described, um, the, that um, hidden away, um, you know, secluded school in the middle of the desert, no electricity, no running water. We're living in tents. We're dealing with scorpions and um, donkeys and cows right. coming into our tents in the middle of the night and eating right. our stuff and uh, sandstorms and just everything. Yeah, running out of water, the wells breaking down, a lot of things, cooking on coals, uh, dealing with poison, deadly snakes, and right. So I'm in that environment. When I come back, and I'm so I'm not just studying the dean and studying these these texts that have been tra- traditionally taught uh, in the same way for over a thousand years and um, the same books and the same authors. Now I'm coming back to the Bay Area, and I on some of my trips home I would do short uh, lessons to teach. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that struck me right away is I said, Subhanallah, the effect that I saw on my life when I was studying that book, I'm not seeing the same result on this student. Mm. I'm not seeing the same result. And this was back in, I would say, 2000, when I first had this experience of teaching somebody after being a couple of years in Mauritania. And I'm looking at it, I'm saying, why isn't the same thing happening? And this question really, really bothered me. Uh, and it's actually one of the reasons why I, went, I chose the, uh, a master's program in educational psychology. And my question was, why do different people interact with the same curriculum in different ways and take away things in a different manner. Mm. Um, and so that's what um, what led me eventually to, to going into just to, to find out why is that happening. Well, one of the things that I realized is that the environment is very important. The environment where you're, where you're studying that material, the background that the student comes with you. So if you can imagine, like, the curi- here's the curriculum, here's the book right in front of you that you're studying. Mm. But this student is coming with their background. The teacher is coming with their background. The author of that book is coming with the background. The environment where that's being studied is, is ha- has a background. All of these dynamics come to play in the, the that teacher-student interaction of that book, and then now you can understand more of why people are coming away with different things. Mm-hmm. W- one of the things one of my students in prison mentioned to me, he said, when we heard about your experience in, in Mauritania and how you studied, we were able to relate because you're cut off from society. You have very little resources, and those are two big things that define prison life. Mm-hmm. When you have people that... Um, have very little. They make do with very little. Like one time, we uh, one of the um, things we asked on our application, we used to, we used to ask, we said, if, you're, if you feel you're eligible for financial aid and can't pay for this course, explain why. We stopped asking that question because 99.9% of our students are eligible. They're fuqara. And they have absolutely no money mm. to even pay for a book. Some of them in the, uh, and going back to the 13th Amendment thing, you can pay a prisoner 25 cents an hour, five cents an hour, a dollar an hour in the prison uh, to do heavy labor, uh, fight fires in California, fire cramps. So there is that type of uh, cheap labor that's available in the prison. And you can read about the corporations that, that utilize that and so forth and the, the, the defense industry that builds things in uh, using prison labor. In any case, they have very little money. So one student told me, he said, um, I, have five, I get $5 a month. I, I would like to keep three for my own personal use, and I can send Leba two. Oh, now imagine that, sending 20% of your salary. Don't look at it as $2. Look at it as 20% of your salary. And he said, I'd like to have uh, $3 a month to, um, uh, to, to keep for personal items. Now, we, we changed our policy. We, we actually never even charged any of the students. We were just trying to find out, are they eligible for zakat money, you know, financial aid? Once we established, yeah, they're eligible for zakat, we stopped asking that. We just said, you know, we have a different process, cause, and we provide everything. We've always provided everything free of charge to them, uh, but we just stopped asking that question. 
So I asked one of the other prisoners, I said, why would he need $3 to pay for personal items? He said, well, they don't provide us deodorant, so we oh. need to buy that with our own money. And we buy toothpaste. I said, toothpaste? They don't offer you toothpaste? He said, no, they give us tooth powder. Wow. Now, has anybody ever heard of what's, tooth powder? What's that? Yeah, what is that? So human Indian so, cups. You know, so these are men that like imagine you're living in a six by twelve uh, concrete box. Mm-hmm. Um, you you might be uh, your your entire world belongings are in a trunk. I mean, I'm a, you've been in the Mahdras in Mauritania. That's essentially a, a student's house over there yeah. Yeah. by choice, right? Yeah. So so d- that environment, like the students were able to relate to me. They said because you studied with uh, without resources. Without, you know, studying with a flashlight. Well, they can relate to that because when it's lights out, you don't have any lights. You know, you might have to go to the edge of your cell. Like if you're familiar with the autobiography of Malcolm X, he would have to go to the edge of his cell to, to catch a little bit of that little light to, to read. Um, so that, that's one thing that they were able to relate <clears throat> to relate to me on. You know, in, in our society or communities, we have a lot of barriers that we deal with when we're dealing with the formerly incarcerated the the reintegration aspect, right? How do you introduce them back into the masjid and uh, meeting people to feel comfortable? So you mean uh, brothers from the prison? Yeah, yeah, yeah going. By, it's a, it's a good uh, question because, as you mentioned, you know, there's a lot of people who are not comfortable with the idea of prisons, also because they don't understand the dynamics. Now, this is one thing that's really important to know. The Aba Foundation and the work that I do, we teach prisoners. But it's not like if we were in Egypt teaching prisoners or Jordan teaching prisoners or any other Muslim country, Pakistan, India, uh, any Muslim, co- Muslim majority country, and you go to their prisons. And the reason why the difference is is because those prisoners were born Muslim, raised in a, in a Muslim household. They had their Muslim identity from a, a, um, from a child. Now, whether or not, uh, you know, what was the level of their identity, what was their level of Islamic knowledge, but they were raised Muslim. They went through that process. In the prisoners, 90% of our students at Taiba are converts to Islam. 70% of the total population become Muslim in prison. So some of them became Muslim on the streets and went to prison. And, but 70, 70% of our students became Muslim in prison. This, is, this might seem just like an interesting demographic, but it, it, it's very important to understand. Because these are people who live the Jahiliya life. And for those of us who are familiar with the stories of the Sahaba and the Jahiliya, you know, when you think of the prisoners that we're work, working with, think of Khalid ibn Walid who used to attack and kill the Muslims. And he made the decisive decision at Uhud which led to the slaughter of many Muslims. It was him and his... Essentially, Khalid bin Walid had an elite force. He was like the special forces of whatever battle he was in. Yeah. He had heavy riders, cavalry, that would not go from one direction. They would always... They, they would move. They were very light and... Sorry, light cavalry, and they would move, move around. So when the archers left the hill, he noticed that immediately, and he said... He told his uh, horsemen... Let's go around the hill, and they, 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 they cornered the Muslims, and they slaughtered them. This Khalid bin Walid becomes Muslim. Now, imagine if you brought Khalid bin Walid to circa 2016 and put them in CDCR, California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, he's going to be on maybe death row or at least life in prison for murder and whatever else he did, right? Mm. Okay. So with that in mind... It, I think that would help our Muslim community understand, like, these are, like, think of that as the prisoner that, that is here in the U.S. It's not a Muslim that was born and raised as a Muslim, should have known better of what they did, you know, um, and we can have that as a separate discussion on how much they got uh, in terms of their Islamic tarbiyah. But that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with people who had a journey to Islam. They made a conscious decision to leave their jahiliyyah, or at least choose a way of life that is against their jahiliyyah, and they're working towards that. So it has, it's, there's a different dynamic. You know, if I went, I don't think I would be able to do this same exact work in the way that we're doing in a Muslim-majority country. Like, we're dealing with 90% of Makes our sense. students are converts. Makes sense. So it's important for the community to know that, that these are converts coming to us. It is. That shifts our paradigm, the way you it mentioned should, it. Yes. Yeah. And so it's not just like, oh, they should have known better. No, think of this just like, just like we give a pass. We give a pass to the Sahaba. We're like, Wahshi, you killed Hamza? Radhi Allahu anka. May Allah be pleased with you because you became Muslim. And you redeemed yourself. And you later. redeemed yourself. Hind, you ordered the assassination of Hamza, the Lion of Allah, Asadullah. Radhi Allahu anki. May Allah be pleased with you. Not for that act, but because you became Muslim, Allah you Allah. repented, mm-hmm. you made your tawbah, and we understand the power of repentance and redemption and human change. Well, why can't we apply those same principles to our brothers and sisters in prison? Sisters in prison who were uh, literally selling themselves on the street, and now they become Muslim. But when they get out of prison, and this is a true story, when they get out of prison, this one sister who became Muslim, 
The only person to pick her up at the prison was her pimp. No oh Muslim God. infrastructure to go to and say, hey, sister, we're going to help you introdu- introduce you back into society. Mm-hmm. And she said, she told one Muslim that was working with her, she said, you know, I might go to, back to a lot of bad things, but I will never leave la ilaha illallah. Wow. Now, where are the Muslims? I know two separate Muslims that went to a prison, uh, sorry, that were in prison. They became Muslim in prison. And they, go, they step into a masjid, two separate masjids, t- separated by about 12 years, two different communities. And both of these brothers, they go into the masjid, the first masjid. Imagine, they became Muslim, and he's Muslim in prison. He's never stepped foot in a masjid. Mm-hmm. So a lot of these brothers who have been in Muslim and sisters who have been Muslim for 20, 25, 30 years in prison, the first thing they say, even if their families come to pick them up, they say, I'm not, I can't go to mom's, uh, mom your house right away. I want to go to the masjid. And do two rak'ahs, two units of prayer to thank, give thanks to Allah. Like that's, they're waiting decades to go to a masjid. Wow. So this brother goes to a masjid. He sees a man, says, Assalamu alaikum. What does the man return? He say, Wa, he's, uh, The brother says, Assalamu alaikum. The person looks at him and says, Wa alaikum. Oh, man. Two brothers experience that. One brother is like his, he's at the masjid. He, and this is a, you know, a, a hard uh, prisoner. He cried when he was relating that story. He said, what is it? Like, like he literally put his life on the line in prison for Islam. He could have been killed for it by his, uh, for his Islam. Wow. I know one brother who, um, he contacted me. He said, there's a white person who became Muslim in prison. And in California prisons, it's dominated by race. So if you're white, you go with the rights, the white supremacists. If you're black, you're with the, the African-Americans. Mexican, northern, southern, so forth. There's all these dynamics. So this white person becomes Muslim, and he, and he can't even give salams to the Muslim. He can't pray. He can't be seen with the Muslims because if the white supremacists see him with the, the Muslims, who are mostly black, they're going to say, you crossed the racial line. You're, we're going to kill you. So he's literally holding on to his Islam at the threat of death. Mm-hmm. Now these brothers and sisters come out into society, and this is how we treat them. Wa alaikum, because we all know what the wa alaikum means, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Who do we give that? You know, how do we respond to and who? So that's the dynamics that they come into. Sometimes some communities embrace them. At the same time, there's also brothers and sisters that come out into the community. They go to the uh, the, the masjids, and because of not knowing how to properly interact, sometimes they might take advantage of whatever is in the uh, uh, services that are offered to them. So you have some communities are like, look, we tried to extend our hand, but we've just been burned a couple of times. So what we try to do at Tayba is we say, okay, look, this is we're gonna we have a long term plan for our communities. We're gonna work with these Muslim brothers and, and sisters in prison while they're in prison, get them ready for reintegration into society, specifically the Muslim community. And when they come out, I can call up a person in Houston or Dallas or New Jersey and say, hey, look, I have a Tayba student. I've worked with him for five years. I can vet him. You know, uh, go into the, you know you you can trust this person. And if I can't do that, then I can just say we have, you know, we'd like to offer you the services, but just, you know, we can't, we can't vet him, don't necessarily get him married into the community until you vet him as a community. So that's one of the things that we try to do. Redemption is a crazy thing. We always want redemption, but we're very careful or very weary to give it out to other people. Right. I was blown away by some of the stories. I had a chance to look at your website, the documentary. There's that one brother, I think. When he decided to eat the bihad meat, I think he was only eating rice and beans for like 18 years. Yeah. I think the brother, he passed away with cancer yeah, yeah. like a year ago. The brother, brother Yusuf in the documentary, like I'm, I'm learning Arabic right now. It's a struggle. This guy learned Arabic in prison along with studying advanced texts. I mean, I think there's a lesson for a lot of these brothers for us out in, in the real world. And are you okay if we mention their names because they're already on the documentary? And it's public yeah, anybody video. that's on public forum, and yeah. Brother Yusuf, I was so inspired by his story. He's like, I went through volumes of Bukhari. I covered every hadith in Bukhari because I, I was like, Allahu Akbar, man. You got you get these individuals that are getting all of these amazing resources and getting through knocking out all of these hadith. I don't even mean to say it that way, but what I mean to say is he he basically breezed through the, all of Bukhari and he went through all these uh, all the different literature. So that that was very inspiring. Again, our listeners should uh, definitely pay attention to that documentary. I, I want to throw in uh, one thing, inshallah. Uh, I love to see uh, that balance when somebody studies uh, a classical, especially in a classical setting, they study fiqh, they study tafsir, they study the aqidah, they study everything they need to do. But when they come back to their comfort zone, they're doing social work, right? Mm-hmm. And the re- and I think that balance is the perfect balance to have. Because the Shaykh of al Shaykh Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in order for him to get his reputation, he was a very social person. And someone can say, oh no, he came from an influential family. If he came from an influential family, his asadiq and amin 
didn't have anything to do with coming from an influential family. It happened to be that he was very generous to people and he uplifted people. He helped those individuals. Like Khadija, she said, Muhammad, that, you know, you're the one, I, I can't even remember the exact hadith, but you lift up the person who's weak and the person who's poor, you give him. And the person who is oppressed, you help him against the oppressor and you side with this person, you're trusted. And all these amazing characteristics. And 40 years of doing all of that and everybody understands that this person is out just for you and to help you. He is your true shepherd because he knows what's good for you. And even though you don't know what's good for you, then he gets his revelation, right? So I see that that balance is one of the best balances for the human being to have as far as social work is concerned. And this is social work at its best because social work for me and talking to youth or me and helping uh, people with pre-marriage counseling or marriage counseling, that's I'm still in my comfort zone. I don't really have any repercussions and I don't I'm not dealing with any type of physical threat. And I'm not I don't mean to generalize in any way, but somebody who's never been to prison and who was raised in the suburbs like myself, just the thought of visiting prison and spending time there is is a very scary thing for me. Now, you, know? you were also from the suburbs too, and you were exactly. raised in, in the suburbs, mm-hmm. Sheikh Rami. Yeah. Um, how, what kind of mis- or misconceptions that you yeah, well, had that were changed? Like, I'm pretty sure the first time you went in there, depending on how you went in there, were you scared? Or, and how did that change everything? Like no, no, mentioned? I wasn't scared at all. In fact, I mean, it was one of the best experiences of my life to go to, go to prison. <laughs> uh, by choice, of course, you know. But uh, And I'll explain why. But one of the, a couple of things that helped me, uh, one of the main things that helped me was really the autobiography of Malcolm X and then later the movie when it came out. So and I think well. everybody, yeah. that should be required reading for every Muslim, yeah, you know, sure. and especially Muslims in America. But if you're overseas and listening to this podcast and you want to understand the dynamics of America, read the autobiography of Malcolm X. In yeah. addition, other uh, re- uh, reading material that we should, if you want to understand the dynamics of the African-American experience in, in America, which directly relates to the prison experience because they're overrepresented in the prisons. And it's not because they're committing crimes more than other people, which some racists might like to you know, insinuate or, or state. But it's because of the way the system is set up, you know, for uh, there were more people getting convictions for the use of crack than there were people getting convictions for cocaine. Well, who's using cocaine and who's using crack? Mm. So if the laws are set up there to convict more users of crack, which are poor minorities, um, uh, the poor and the minorities. So you also have the poor whites overrepresented than the rich whites in prisons. So you have that dynamic. But read The New Jim Crow. There's a book called The New Jim Crow. And you can see how the, the post-Civil War, the, the, the current U.S. prison system really got into full force right after the Civil War. Well, what did that coincide with the end of? The end of slavery. So there is a direct co- co- correlation between the end of the Civil War in the U.S. and the beginning of mass incarceration. Well, then go also to the late 70s and the 80s and the war on drugs and the, um, the, war on drugs and the tough on crime um, uh, policies, which led to a dramatic a 500% increase in the prison population. The majority of which are nonviolent drug 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 offenders. Mm. So it's we've flooded the prison systems with all of these people. The majority are now African Americans. So to understand Islam in America, Islam in the prisons, the African American ex- experience, we have to understand a lot of uh, a lot of those backgrounds. So I've been able to read a lot more and understand a lot more and hear a lot more from people now. But before starting this work, just knowing about the life of Malcolm X mm. was re- it was a it was a good way to open up into to this um, to this society plus I was in California so although I wasn't in you know in and I was in a suburban area from middle school on you know you see the the accounts of of, uh, of the gang life and the street culture and the gang culture in the media whether it's in the forms of like movies like boys in the hood or um, juice or you know some of these other m- movies that like highlight or blood in blood out and some of these other movies that as a you know as a teenager I watched them so I got a little bit of kind of like exposure to gang life whether or not American me was another one and so some of these reflected accurately what was going on other was of course, Sometimes Hollywood embellishes, but some of those kind of like got me used to understanding like what is is going on in the prison. There's another um, uh, book. It's called Monster, and he was a, a, a crip. He was so ruthless on the street they called him Monster, mm. and now he goes to prison and becomes Muslim. So, wow! And I, when I went down to Southern California one time, I was trying to ask people, "Do you know what community this this brother might be in now?" And they're like, "Who are you talking there? Oh, you mean Street Sheikh?" 
<laughs> so he went from being monster <laughs> to street chair. Wow. Going that around, walking impressive. around in the hood, giving yeah. dawah. Love you know, good. so that's the transformation that, yeah. like, if you can see the potential, Khalid bin Walid to, to Saif Allah, Umar bin al Khattab to, you know, Al Farooq, monster to street sheikh, you know, seeing that, Allah you know, yeah. uh, uh, red. Malcolm X, Malcolm right? Z, yeah, Malcolm right. Little, his nickname. To Al Hajj Malik al Shabazz. Yeah. You know, that transformation. So, seeing that going into prison, that was what I ha- I was looking at the transformation of these men. Some of them are still criminals. You know, just because they become Muslim doesn't mean they left right. crime. But some of them have transformed their lives. Yeah. So, when I used to sit in their presence, it really reminded me of some of the sittings that I had when in Mauritania. To just see like real human beings, mm. some of these men who are, you know, physically very strong. Physically very, you know, the Mauritanian Sheikh Amr, you saw them. Those guys are like, those guys are hardcore. The yeah. Mauritanians are like really like rugged individuals, and yet they're so soft, and yeah. they're like, you know, good Muslims. But if time comes to it, oh, yeah. you know, they can, like one of our uh, Sheikh's um, relatives, they had to fight a lion in Mauritania. And he wrapped up his arm in a turban, and he said, okay, I'm going to go in. I'm going to get this lion uh, uh, on my on my on my hand, you and they didn't have a gun, so they beat it, the lion to to death with sticks. Lord but he God. said we need to get his mouth away from biting everybody. So he said I'm going to wrap my arm up with a turban. I'm going to run in and stick my arm. And Sheikh Mukhtar, I met him, I met this man. He said I'm going to stick my arm in the lion's mouth. Yeah. You guys beat him. Oh, wow. So and this was a lion that had come very close to the village and so forth. So these are the type of individuals that are going to turn around and teach the kids. Okay, now say Elif Bata. <laughs> you know, so meeting these wow. brothers in prison, that was the same thing. These are the same guys that are going to be on the yard. They're not going to instigate something with the white supremacists or with the Mes- Mexican gangs. But if somebody comes to attack them, they're not. You know, they're going to be. They know how to defend themselves. And yet, when it's time, Assalamu alaikum, brother. How are you doing? Yeah. You know, so just seeing that was very, mm. it was, it was, a, it was a good experience going to prison. As far as the toughness, I actually have a kind of a funny story here. Um, as far as the toughness of the Mauritanians con- are concerned, this is actually a true story. So when I, I go to Mauritania, I'm still kind of a lot bigger compared to these guys from Mauritania. There are a lot of them are really skinny, you know, compared to majority of Americans. So one of the guys, so we were just out one of the nights, I think on Juma, and we were just having tea outside and relaxing and chilling. And then uh, we started talking about wrestling and stuff. I did a little bit of high school wrestling, so I thought it was a little cool, right? So the guy's like, hey, I'll wrestle you. I was like, yeah, whatever. He's like, he, the guy was literally 100 pounds less than me. And I'm not making this up. Allah, I'm not making this up. Skinny. I at the time was probably like 170, 180 pounds. This dude was, he was probably like 100, 112, maybe 115 pushing it. And he was half my age too. I was like, I'm not going to wrestle you, man. I'll break you in half. You know, I don't want This guy, he wrestled me. And the strength that this dude had, I was like, where is this strength coming from? Mm-hmm. And he, he literally flipped me on the ground. I was on the ground. I was like, all right, let's do that again. You know, like you see in the movies, yeah. Bruce Lee beating up some big old dude. <laughs> yeah. That was me. <laughs> <laughs> that was me. But then an Eid came around. And this is no joke. I'm not exaggerating. They played this game. I don't know if you witnessed this, where the youth, they see who can drop the camel first. They have... And there's a certain way of is doing that like this. like cow tipping? Or? It, it's, it's kind of <laughs> <laughs> so what they do is, they, you know, the dara, they wear this big dress, they, they, the, the, the gown. They put it over, they take it off. And then they're like, ready, go. Bismillah, go. And what they do is they go for the back legs. They go like that. They clamp the back legs and they try to wrestle it down. One person, not, not multiple people. I saw one dude do this. And this guy was probably 15, 20 years old, maybe. No more than 20 years old, right? And I wouldn't even go, ne- I wouldn't go near that beast. There's no way I would mess with a camel. Oh, shoot. You know? Uh, if that thing kicks you once, it's going to break your ribs, right? Um, and then you see that you don't even see that side of them uh, because they're always being so nice, like you mentioned. But if they really need to throw down, they're going to be some guys that you, there's a force to be reckoned with. You don't yeah. want to mess with a desert dude that's, you know, that's raised in a desert, yeah. man, you know? The Arabs used to send people to the desert to get them strong and tough. You yeah. know? Yeah. And that's, that's, the, that's the tarbiyah that they're getting inside. And right. um, the other thing is, too, you know, the, this nicety that I see with the, or the soft, the soft side of the brothers is, uh, and, and, you know, from the, 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 we have sisters. Alhamdulillah, we actually had an initiative this semester to boost our uh, female student population. So we, we, we went from, uh, Four percent to fifteen percent. So we went from eight, uh, fifteen students, one five to fifty wow. five zero five hundred. Uh, and that was actually um, a request from one of our um, uh, so uh, one of our um, sponsoring organizations, Smile Foundation, mm-hmm. uh, Zakat Inspired, and they said we would like to see more uh, more ladies. And I said, well, the ladies in prison it's just it's they're, they're only six to seven of the total prison population. But we'll go ahead and you know we'll we'll make an active effort to to increase that. But these men and women, they're going to go back into society with 
to, to areas that the people from suburbia, we're not going to go into. Mm-hmm. We're not going to reach. Right. So if we can equip them properly with Islamic education and with being socially, uh, socially minded, you know, to be able to go out there and, and, and help people. So um, that's going to be very impactful. That's what happened what's, well, in West Africa. So those men that, like you described, the rugged, the mm-hmm. people that we saw, at the same time, they're you know, helping the widow, helping the orphan. Mm, helping yeah. the, so they're going out into the, to the reaches of the desert to help people. These guys are going to go out into the deserts of America, you know, the, the food mm-hmm. desert. So yeah. That's a powerful confirmation. Sheikh Rami has been real. We appreciate you coming on. Um, how can people learn more about you and connect with you or get involved with Taiba Foundation? Well, the first thing I would say is uh, go to our website and, and learn about some of the work that we do and watch some of the documentaries, some of the interviews with some of our students. You know, you can hear words from the students. We have some of the letters of our students posted on our, uh, of course, with their uh, personal information blocked out on our website and on our Facebook. You can see uh, accounts and stories and so forth. And that's really how, if you want to if you want to know, if you want to get a window into the prison uh, world, then hear their words and read their uh, read their letters. When somebody comes to the Taiba office out in Union City, California, where we're, we're located, um, if they say, oh, I'm here to volunteer, one of the first things I'll do is, even though we have a lot of things going on in the office, I'll say, go to that desk. There's a pile of letters. We need those responded to. And read them and, like, tell me what it is. Now, I could assign a lot of other things, and we can have a staff member, you know, read those letters, but I want people to read those letters, and then they just come off. You see a total switch. Once they see the words of the prisoners themselves, like explaining what they're doing, uh, it, it's a different um, uh, different experience. So that's one thing, just to learn more about what we're doing. Uh, and then, of course, you know, every organization needs financial support, so we would encourage, you know, any financial donations are, are um, appreciated, um, especially monthly donors. Even if it's just a couple dollars a month, you know, we're trying to build up our monthly donor donor basis. And are you guys accepting zakat money also? Yes, for we are, we're accepting zakat. And we have a, a zakat distribution policy that's been approved by Shiuch, so it's a traditional uh, method of uh, of distributing the zakat so that the zakat covers the um uh, i mean we spend uh, what i tell people is that if you can imagine uh, a fedex kinkos you know that does copying mm-hmm. printing and shipping if a fedex kinkos got married to a medrasa and they had a child <laughs> it would be Taiba. <laughs> because we're printing and shipping and Love attaching it. tracking numbers and you know following up so we're printing the material we're developing the islamic material collecting it compiling it printing it packaging it shipping it out you know we so we use we're very avid users of uh, you know shipping methods and so forth um and so that's what um uh we, we spend a lot of money on postage and on printing the material and preparing it so um that's where the zakat goes to to support providing it for the students who are who are you know well deserving of zakat funds mashallah so even for our, our listeners we know that ramadan is coming up a lot of people give their zakat in ramadan let's try to direct it towards those individuals especially who have been incarcerated and trying to get re you know reformed back into society i think we should definitely uh, focus on on that and just facilitating, just giving sadaqah to facilitate this whole operation. I'm pretty sure this operation is not, not easy. Um, the second thing is, just a personal question for me. If individuals want to learn uh, fiqh al-maliki or you know, uh, the, the maliki jurisprudence or legal code, um, do you, how, do you do, how do you go about doing that uh, as far as teaching? Do you teach online or do you... Yeah, I, I teach mostly maliki fiqh. I teach it mostly online. And the okay. other courses are well that are you know, open to... You know uh, that are not Maliki fiqh, like the yeah. books of Sheikh Muhammad Maulud, mashallah, uh, on the purification of the heart, the prohibitions of the tongue, rights of parents, and his whole Adab s- uh, series. He has a book just on the um, the illu- it's called the illumination of the afterlife, just mm-hmm. the whole spiritual aspect of the prayer. So the spiritual fiqh, how do you get presence in the prayer? How do you mashallah. prepare for the prayer and so forth? Um, so I teach those online. Some of the courses are on Seekers Hub. Uh, dot org, um, and also if they if they contact us at at Leiba, we have um, we have some Maliki fiqh courses that are also being offered um, nice through sure. online, so they can contact us through that. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, the people you're teaching are they all learning learning Maliki fiqh? What we do, um, uh, we have we're offering uh, all, right now we're offering three of the four madhabs of the four, four madhabs of Ahl Sunnah. Um, and we just haven't gotten to the stage. We have the plans to add the Hanbali Madhab as well, but we give the choice to the students. Okay. So they all have to study uh, basic fiqh 
and uh, of uh, prayer and purification, fasting, zakat, the five pillars of their fiqh, mm -hmm. along with the rules of marriage and the rules of buying and selling and so forth. But And we give them the option. There's Maliki option, Hanafi option, Shafi'i option, and ho hopefully soon we hope to add the, the Hanbali option as well uh, so that they you know can choose that. And we don't even actually require them to follow a madhab. You know, they, we just want them to read and be exposed and to understand sure. where the fiqh uh, comes from. Uh, but really what we do is we, we offer the, uh, the, the fiqh, but... Um, Every one of our courses, whether it's fiqh, uh, law, whether it's theology, aqidah, or whether it's, uh, it's all built around character development and character reformation. Beautiful. So it all has an aspect of akhlaq. How has this fiqh text helped you in your akhlaq? How has it made you a better person, a better family member, a better community member? Are you learning fiqh so that you can go out there and tell people haram, haram, haram? Are you learning aqidah to tell people bid'ah, bid'ah, shirk? Or are you using this fiqh? To, to help you uh, heal the wounds in our communities. And we ask them to write essays on that, reflective essays. And so we want to see that. So they won't actually pass the fiqh course unless they show us that this has made you a better human being. Allah. Has it actually, actually made you more tolerant? Had ma made you less, uh, less prone to anger and less prone to uh, uh, intolerance and so on and so forth. And, um, and we get beautiful stories of change. How you know the, the the rules of fiqh can actually heal a community. Sometimes funny. One time there was one brother, and he said uh, there was a person he had. He was a gang leader. He became Muslim. Was made the imam of the the jama'a, which has its own issues, complexities, and dynamics. But this other brother, he was leading the prayer, and he did a sajda. Uh, during, he read an ayah of sajda during the during the prayer, and he went into sajda. And so afterwards, some of the prisoners who were not familiar with it, they said, you know, they got into an argument about it. It was actually going to lead to a fight. And you can imagine these tough people yeah. in prison, if they get in a fight over, you know, you, you led the prayer wrong, brother. You know, we're going to teach you a lesson. So, right. so this brother who had studied fiqh, he turned, and everybody's just talking from their own opinion and what little they know. But this one of our students who took a basic introductory book of fiqh, he said, well, according to the book of Imam al-Akhdari, it says in this situation you do this, this, and this. And he said just him being able to speak authoritatively in that with a reference, with a book, with a citation saying, I'm not, you know, giving, it's not conjecture, it's not my opinion. It, he said it, it, it solved uh, essentially a fight from breaking out, wow. you know, over that. So it's, awesome. it's very impactful. And so we have, um, uh, we, in answer to your question, we, we teach multiple uh, views of fiqh um, and also um, um, have the component of, of building tolerance. That's very well. good. For the benefit of our listeners, what is the actual website for Taiba? The website is www.tabafoundation.org. That Taiba is spelled T-A-Y-B-A foundation.org so you can go there learn more about it also for for those listeners out here out there if you're trying to figure out what you want to do in the world try to do something that you're going to benefit the world and social work is a great way to do that um, yes we need doctors yes we need engineers but alhamdulillah I think in our community we have enough lawyers doctors and engineers mm -hmm. we sure, need right. social workers we need people in the child protective arena we need uh, counselors we need people who can who can build up human beings so yes we need to build buildings and yes we need to heal the bodies of people but do we have people out there who can build human beings and build the societies go into the inner cities go into uh, the areas where there's and I'm talking about here in the US where there's food uh, there's food insecurity and go help people in in whatever you in whatever way you can but if you can align your profession with helping people and helping the society and giving back being givers rather than takers that's what your your job is as a muslim well, that's, that's a beautiful way to close out Jazakallah khair, Sheikh Rami. Yeah, no thank really you busy. for inviting me, the mad man looks. <laughs> You're not that mad. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> <laughs> we hope to do this again sometime. Hopefully we can keep this relationship going. Inshallah. 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 I look forward to it. Inshallah. Inshallah. Uh, to our listeners out there, if you have any comments or feedback, you can email us at themadmamluks at gmail.com. That's T-H-E-M-A-D-M-A-M-L-U-K-S. You can also reach out to us and follow us on Twitter at the Mad Mom Luke's or like our Facebook page by the same name. For Sheikh Amr Saeed and Sim, this is Mahin for the Mad Mom Looks signing off. Assalamu alaikum.